Welcome to this third video in the Bacteriology Masters Ethics Workshop. In this case, what we're going to go through is moral issues in risk assessment. And this is talking about the design and outcome of epidemiological studies and how they involve potentially controversial moral judgments. You're going to find out that making decisions about public health when from a government perspective is far more difficult than it first seems. There is a tension between good science that would be recognized as valid and publishable in a reputable scientific journal and good regulation. And that's regulation that takes place and puts a special premium on protecting human health. You have the biggest problems when the background rate of disease is rare, less than one to 10,000, and sample sizes are small due to either expense or you can't expose people intentionally to whatever you're trying to investigate. The big problem here is when scientific conventions are adopted uncritically. Just some reminders. The null hypothesis. This is a statement that whatever treatment or experiment you are doing has no effect. For example, exposure to benzene is not harmful and will not cause cancer. Some other review things. The null and alternative hypotheses. A type 1 error, alpha, is the probability of a false positive. You never want this in science. It is the incorrect rejection of the null hypothesis. So, for example, thinking benzene is harmful when it's not. Or, this is like a fire alarm going off when there is no fire. A type 2 error, beta, is the probability of a false negative. This is incorrect acceptance of the null hypothesis. Thinking benzene is not harmful when it is. And this would be a fire breaking out and the alarm not going off. Okay, so the two things to keep in your head to keep these straight. Alpha is the probability of a false positive. That's a fire alarm going off. Beta is the probability of a false negative, And that's a fire breaking out when the alarm doesn't go off. Other important values. 1 minus beta is the power of the test. And values close to 1 mean that false negatives are rare. So it's a good test. And delta is the relative risk, right? So it's the incidence rate among exposed individuals divided by the incidence rate among non-exposed. And n is the total number of subjects. Okay, so what we're trying to do in this, in these kind of experiments, when you're investigating compounds that might be harmful, is you're trying to stay in the two zones here, the upper left and the lower right. The, it, the null hypothesis accepted and the null hypothesis is actually true or the null hypothesis is rejected and the alternative hypothesis that something is harmful is accepted and you should reject the null hypothesis. You're trying to avoid type 1 errors, which is a false positive, and type 2 errors, which are a false negative. Okay, so now we're going to consider alpha, beta, 1 minus beta, and risk of errors and standard of proof. So we're going to go through some examples. What we're trying to find out is what the chance of error is a researcher willing to take. And that depends on the seriousness of the outcome. How serious of a problem is it that we fail to detect a potential carcinogen versus that due to providing misleading fundamental research in scholarly journals? There is a tension between the risk of error versus standards of proof. In many legal situations, all that is required to reach a verdict is that preponderance of evidence is enough to convict. What does preponderance mean? Does that mean 51% of the time this is true? 60% of the time? 80%? Basically, how certain do researchers need to be? So as, as a specific example, how certain do researchers need to be to determine whether benzene presents a threat. If 51% of scientists think it's a threat, does that mean that it's something we should regulate? 
Can regulatory agencies prepared to take 49% chance of declaring that benzene is not a carcinogen when it actually is? In other words, beta would be 0.49. What we are getting at here is for the presentation of a false positive 0.05, which is the normal scientific standard, you would want to be sure that there is only a 5% chance that the observed difference between the benzene exposed population and the control was due to random event, events. That's a very low risk of error. But what standard of proof do you need before declaring benzene dangerous? And how do you do those experiments? Here's the whole relative risk table. Let's look at specifics. If we take the scientific perspective where alpha is set to 0.05, beta is set to 0.05. So you want uh, a true negative 95% of the time, a false negative 5% of the time, a false positive 5% of the time, and a true positive 95% of the time. So this is the typical scientific standard. If you run it through a formula, and we're talking about a relative risk of three, that means that you are three times more likely to get cancer if you're exposed to benzene. That's our example that we're using here than if you're not exposed you actually need a population of n divided by 2 or 13,495 people in each test group. You may not be able to find 14,000 people that have been exposed to benzene. And even if you could, this experiment would be prohibitively expensive. So it's cost too much. You cannot do this. You can't afford to do these types of experiments. Okay, so let's change this. The relative risk, we're gonna leave at three. We're gonna keep the probability of a false positive at 5%, right? And then we're gonna do the rest of this. We're gonna set beta 0.2, meaning there's a one in five chance of a type two fair error. Declaring a chemical is significant when in fact it's not declaring benzene dangerous when in fact it's not. If we loosen this up, we decrease the population that we need to verify that, but it's still 7,695 subjects in each cohort. This study is still too large. It's too expensive. We need to get the numbers down. Alternative three is we increase the relative risk. So let's start from a more practical standpoint. Based on available resources, we can study 2,000 people in each group, 2150. Can we deduct, uh, conduct a meaningful study? Again, if we leave alpha at 0.05 and beta at 0.2, what is the size of the effect that we could detect? At best, we could detect a relative risk of six. That means that you, have, you would have a six times higher likelihood of cancer is what we could detect. If exposure to benzene actually only made you twice as likely to get cancer or five times as likely, we would not be able to detect it in this study. So therefore, this probably isn't sensitive enough. A negative result in this study says nothing about relative risk below six. I bet you you'd like to know if you're exposed to benzene that your risk of cancer is twice as high. We can't detect it in this study. Okay, here's another alternative. Where do we have to set beta to to get the relative risk down below four? It turns out we'd have to set beta at 0.49. That means that the odds that exposed subjects will remain exposed to a harmful substance are 49%. If we set beta at 0.49, we have a chance of a false negative about half the time. So this is gonna allow chemicals to slip through that are actually dangerous. Okay, so this one's totally unacceptable. Okay, so we've held uh, alpha at 0.05, meaning we never get false positives. What if we relax that? We make false positives coming through 33% of the time. That, so here's our one last alternative. We'll, one says some unattractive features to those who are trained as conventional research scientists. Let's keep N the same, assign delta 3, beta 2. So what does alpha have to be to get this to work? 
alpha end up being 0 0.33. We would have only 60% confidence of not incurring false positives. That means one third of the time we would declare a chemical carcinogen when in fact it wasn't. This sort of study would not be publishable via current research channels. Nonetheless, we would stand a better chance of identifying potential risks associated with the substance since the power of the test is now 80%. Right, so you're going to get interesting information. Right, so this presents a dilemma. Which one of these alternatives do we use? We can only have about 2,000, 2,150 people in our research cohort. What do you do? Alternatives one and two probably ex are excluded as being impractical. There's too many people, especially since our background rate of eight in 10,000 is actually quite high. Leukemia is 10 times lower, eight in 100,000. And even if alternative five can only detect the delta of 12 or higher at that rate. So as long as alpha is less than beta and alpha is in the neighborhood of 0.05, we are doing better science but I also may be protecting harmful substances rather than human health. And this attitude is called dirty hand science. That is scientists ignoring the policy issues at stake. You do not want to declare a chemical safe when it's not. What do you do of the three alternatives, three, four, and five, which do you pick? What's the correct moral theory to apply here? We'll talk about it in class.